Okay, today we're going to continue our discussion of um, types of instabilities. Uh, and in particular, what we want to do is to talk now about a particular type of instability, one which is called a, a flow instability. And it goes under the particular name of a two-stream or perhaps a streaming instability. So let's um, talk about... Uh, so-called uh, two-stream. Uh, there are various forms of two-stream instabilities. Um, and the particular form we're going to look at is electrons streaming relative to stationary <coughs> ions. Um, so what we do is we assume a number of things to simplify the analysis. And basically what we assume uh, is that we're in the ion rest frame. Oh, well let's say, in ion rest frame. And in that ion rest frame, the electrons uh, move with flow velocity uh, V naught E, an electron flow velocity. Also, we'll assume that this is a so-called cold plasma, by which we mean that the electron temperature is equal to zero, and the ion temperature is equal to zero. Um, again, for simplicity, for the simplest possible model, uh, we'll talk about no magnetic field. And we'll have an infinite uh, homogeneous plasma. So, you know, all a lot of the usual, a lot of the usual assumptions, uh, plus a few that make life easy. So the basic thing we're doing relative to a cold plasma dispersion relation we've been talking about of electrons or ions, uh, you know, plasma oscillations or something like that, is that we've allowed for one species of particles, namely the electrons, to have a non-zero flow velocity. So that's really the only difference. So let's allow for, uh, then, doing our linearization procedure and all that sort of stuff, will allow for a flow velocity not equal to zero. And I'll work through the <coughs> equations for each species, electrons and ions, and I'll do it generally, uh, and then we'll specialize to the particular cases of electrons or ions. Now, because we've got a cold plasma, we can use a so-called fluid description. Uh, so first we start out with the density conservation equation, dn dt plus del dot nv is equal to zero. Our first step in any such analysis, remember we, in instability analysis, like in wave analysis, we take the equations and then we perturb them about the equilibrium. And then we linearize, means throw away second order terms and higher. So if we linearize, this just becomes partial of n tilde with respect to t. Now, divergence of NV, we're going to have the, the N has both an N naught and a V tilde, and, and an N tilde, and the flow velocity V has a V naught and a V tilde. So we can have then a V tilde just spreading out all those terms, dot grad N naught plus a V naught dot grad n naught, but that's also, well, both of those are going to be zero, but I'll put it down for a moment. And then we'll have, um, plus some more terms here, uh, remember divergence of nv can be written as v dot grad n plus um, n del dot v. So then we have plus n naught del dot v tilde, and then plus n tilde del dot v tilde. Uh, Sorry, V naught. And all of this has got to be equal to zero. Now, because we have an infinite homogeneous plasma, this is zero. Uh, I'm sorry, I need a, uh, I need a V. Uh, there would be a V naught dot del and del n naught term, but it's not important because of uh, the homogeneity of the plasma. So I have a V naught dot del n tilde, and that term. I'll have to take account of now, whereas I haven't before because there's a V naught flow velocity of the plasma. But we will assume that that flow is divergenceless, or that that, you know, it's just a, a uniform flow, no big deal. Um, 
Okay, so uh, now uh, the next step, of course, is we assume that we're interested in wave-like structures, e to the i k dot x minus i omega t. And so, you know, we do e to the i k dot x minus i omega t. And all that says is convert the time derivatives into minus i omegas, convert the gradients into i k's. And what that then gives us is minus i omega n tilde uh, plus i k dot v naught n tilde. So that's for that term. And then plus i uh, k dot v tilde times n naught is all equal to zero. But now notice that we have a, two terms that are proportional to the density perturbation. And I can organize those together. And so I can write all of this as minus i times omega minus k dot v naught times n tilde is equal to, and now uh, over on the other side, this will be minus i k dot v tilde n naught. Uh, now I can you know, get rid of the minus i's if I want to, for simplicity. And then uh, notice, usually we, when we do this uh, without a flowing plasma, we just get that n tilde is equal to k dot v tilde, the compressional effect, divided by omega. But here the, we don't get omega. We get omega minus k dot v. And what does the k dot v represent? Well, all it is is obviously a Doppler shift. I'm in the stationary frame. The plasma is moving, so there's a Doppler shift in the frequency k dot v naught. So then to, to summarize this relation, what we then get is that the perturbed density is k dot v tilde divided by omega minus k dot v naught, the equilibrium flow. All of this is times n naught. So that was what we had to do to, to analyze the density perturbation equation, or I'm sorry, the continuity equation. Next, we go on to the momentum balance equation. So there, and, and again, we're doing basically the same thing. So we have mn dv dt is equal to nqe, and we'd have plus v cross b, but I said we don't have any magnetic field for simplicity here. We also have minus gradient of pressure, but uh, we said that t was equal to zero, um, so we'll neglect that. And likewise, there's various collisional terms, small collisional terms, but we're sort of not interested in those either. We're thinking of oscillations, instabilities, much faster than um, collision rates, collision frequencies. So now um, we can uh, go into this relationship. First off, we can cancel out the n, and then we can make this d by dt, remember, was the partial with respect to t plus v dot del times the flow velocity, and that's then equal to q over m e. Now, then if we, again, linearize, partial uh, was, becomes partial of v tilde with respect to t plus then v naught dot del of v tilde, and you could imagine that I might also have a linear term v naught dot del v naught, but again, we just assume a uniform flow, so that's actually equal to zero. And then this is equal to q over m times the fluctuating electric field. So again, we take next the, that was the linearization. The next step is we say, well, assume waves with e to the i k dot x minus i omega t. And this becomes then minus i omega v tilde plus i k dot v naught v tilde is equal to q over m e tilde. Uh, and again, we find this structure that this is minus i omega, uh, minus i, sorry, times omega minus k dot v naught times v tilde is equal to q over m e tilde. So 
you know, we can uh, solve that for the uh, flow velocity induced by a perturbed electric field, which is, of course, a mobility, if you wish. So this would be I Q over M, and usually it would be omega, but now because the species might be moving, we have omega minus K dot V, and upstairs we have the drive electric field. So putting the combination of these two things together, we have that the density perturbation depends upon the flow velocity perturbation. The flow velocity perturbation depends upon the electric field. Um, so we can put the two together by substituting this N into there. And what that then gives us, I'm sorry, this flow velocity into the density equation. And that then gives us N tilde is equal to uh, K dot V will be then I Q K dot E tilde divided by M. Uh, and now uh, we've got two factors of this Doppler shifted frequency. So we've got omega minus K dot V naught quantity squared. So that's kind of what we were uh, trying to get. And the only difference, again, between what we usually get and now is that we have a, a flowing, elect perhaps species, electrons in our case, and therefore the frequency in the denominator um, is Doppler shifted accordingly. Okay, now we want to specialize uh, to the case of either electrons or ions, okay? Aha, we will, yeah, right, we will need an N naught here. Is that, yeah, otherwise we'll, we'll miss it in a little bit. Yeah, good point. Uh, it was up here, yeah, just in the last form. Okay, so our next step then uh, is to specialize to, you know, the ions uh, were a special case which had their flow velocity was equal to zero because we were going to stay in the ion rest frame. And so if we um, look at this equation, we then have, we will just have an I tilde is equal to I Q sub I. Actually, I want to put the I over here. So it's an I K dot E tilde times N naught divided by N naught I, um, divided by the ion mass. And then since the flow velocity of that species of the ions is zero, you just get omega squared. On the other hand, the electrons we allow to have a flow speed. V naught E is equal to zero. And so just writing that out, then we'll have Q sub E I K dot E tilde N naught electron all divided by the electron mass times omega minus K dot V naught electron squared. So now that we have the density perturbations of ions and electrons induced by some perturbation in the electric field in the plasma, what do we do? Well, we stick it in Poisson's equation and we get ourselves a dispersion relation. Uh, Poisson's equation or Gauss's law, let's say in this case. So Gauss's law is, of course, divergence of the electric field is equal to the charge density divided by epsilon naught. Um, charge density means, uh, you know, sum over NQ. So that's 1 over epsilon naught. And then NI QI plus NE QE. You want your V naught E not equal to zero? Oh, yeah, I want my V naught E is not equal. Aha, there. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, I worked kind of hard to keep it. I <laughs> wouldn't want to throw it away. Yeah, thank you. So the idea then is that uh, I'll put in here. Now, if I take the perturbation, okay, in equilibrium uh, for quasi-neutrality, I have to have a balance between the number of ions and number of electrons. So when I perturb, all I get is that del dot E tilde is equal to 1 over epsilon naught times Ni tilde QI plus Ne tilde QE. And, of course, I'm thinking that Q sub E here is a signed quantity. Maybe I should just say that. Namely, minus E, the charge on the electron. Uh, 
Uh, and there would be a term again, 1 over epsilon naught, ni, ni naught, qi, plus ne naught, qe, but that's, of course, equal to 0 by quasi-neutrality. in the equilibrium. Okay, so now the next step, of course, e to the i k dot x minus i omega t gives us i uh, k dot e tilde is equal to 1 over epsilon naught times n i tilde q i plus n e tilde q e. And now I have to substitute in the ion density perturbation, electron density perturbation that we got above. So uh, we'll at least consider doing that. So the idea then is that we'll get I k dot E tilde is equal to 1 over epsilon naught. And now for the ion density perturbation, what we had was this uh, and QI and all that sort of stuff. But we can see that there's a I k dot E common to all, both the ion and electron density. And so I'll write it all this out in a little more suggestive form. So it's N naught I Q I squared over M I epsilon naught. And then 1 over omega squared. That was the ion density perturbation. The electron density perturbation gives me basically the same thing, N naught E Q E squared divided by Me epsilon naught. But now, instead of omega squared, we have this Doppler shifted frequency because the whole electron species is moving, k dot v naught electron squared. And then the whole thing, I'll put it out here in front, I guess, is proportional to I k dot E tilde. Oh, and I guess it looks like I took my e no, epsilon naught factor inside, so we can ditch that out of there. So my dispersion relation for waves in this flowing electron plasma with the ions at rest is omega p i squared over omega squared. That's just the ion plasma frequency. Plus omega p e squared divided by omega minus k dot v naught e quantity squared. Does that exhibit instabilities? How would I know? Well, in some sense, first off, physically, you know, I've said that I'll have a streaming electron species. So if the plasma stream is big enough, in some sense, and maybe the plasma density is high enough or something like that, I maybe expect some instability. How would I, in principle, find out if I have an instability? Well, I just solve this dispersion relation for omega. But if we multiply up by omega, notice to clear the denominator, I'm going to have to multiply by omega squared and omega minus k dot v. So that's going to give me a fourth order equation. or And, and even notice... It's not a, you know, omega squared, omega, or omega fourth, omega squared, and, and unity, but I got a cross term, an omega term when I get finished. So that's not a particularly attractive prospect. I mean, you know, well, you, you, want, you would like to avoid that, okay? Um, well, there's a, a kind of clever way by diagrammatic techniques, which is commonly used in this business, which I'll, I'll show you in a moment, or just diagramming the functions, basically. But what it relies upon is noticing that there, the plasma frequency squared here represents the density. And if I divide through by, say, the electron plasma frequency squared, what I get is that 1 over omega pe squared is equal to omega pi squared over omega pe squared, and then 1 over omega squared, and then plus 1 over omega minus k dot v naught e squared. Now, what is the ratio of the ion plasma frequency squared to the electron plasma frequency squared? Well, this was the ion plasma frequency and this was the electron plasma frequency. So, of course, the ratio is just the electron to ion mass ratio. So, Me over Mi. 
So how the way in which we can write our dispersion relation then is in the form of 1 over omega PE squared is equal to ME over MI, small number, 1 over 1836, over omega squared plus 1 over omega minus K dot V naught E quantity squared. But the thing, so this is our dispersion relation for plasma waves in a moving, you know, with a stream of electrons moving. I can, of course, it's always good to check when you do something a little more complicated. You say, well, suppose I go back to my regular case of no flowing electrons. And then I just get, you know, ignore the small mass ratio. I just get omega squared is equal to omega PE squared. So I get regular electron plasma oscillations. But the advantage of looking at it kind of this way and now doing a diagram is let's notice that this is, say, some function of plasma density, okay, of the equilibrium plasma density. You know, that's 1 over plasma density, so it's some function of plasma density. But everything on the right-hand side is some other function, which is only a function of frequency, given that I specify the K. So the idea is, why don't we plot this function of omega on the right-hand side? We'll call it f of omega. So why don't, we call, why don't we just plot that function and see where we would get various roots? So that's the, the scheme we use. So let's do that. Um, the idea is then we'll plot this function uh, f of omega versus omega. And there's going to be, um, let's go back to this thing. There's going to be two singularities, actually two poles of second order, one at the origin and one out here at k, at omega equals k dot v naught e, right? And at those positions, there's a second order pole. So it's symmetric about that point. And, um, you know, it falls off like 1 over omega away from that, 1 over omega squared. And so, you know, it's doing this. Now, on the other hand, the pole at the origin, this is meant to be at 0, the pole at the origin is, in fact, very, very small. You know, it's 1 over 1,836 times. 0.05% of that one in strength. So it's going to be a very, very narrow thing, okay? And so we can do this. Okay, so now let us imagine we had some particular plasma density, you know, some particular value of 1 over omega p squared, 1 omega p e squared electron plasma frequency. And where are my four roots of the dispersion relation? I've got a fourth order polynomial. Well, my four roots are right there, right there, right there, right there. Are any of them unstable? Well, they all look like I can find a reasonable real omega solution, so there's no real problem. So where do I find any instabilities? Well, if I go to high density, okay, very high density, I will get down to a situation where I'm below this point. Now where are my four roots? Well, I've got a root there, and I've got a root there. It's two out of the four. Where did the other four disappear? How about off in the complex plane, right? At this point, okay, near this minimum, what happens is that we have two, you're expanding about a minimum, and you can show, you go through the mathematics, and you get two complex conjugate roots. Two get roots. Since they're complex conjugates, one of them is going to have either the I, or one of them is going to have an imaginary part um, greater than uh, zero. Um, 
Now let, we'd like to do a little bit of mathematics associated with this. So let's uh, figure out where does this maximum occur? Where does this minimum occur as a function of omega? How big is it, which will determine frankly, the onset of instability. How high does the density have to be in order for 1 over omega p squared to be small enough so that I go below that minimum and have my two complex conjugate roots? So to answer those sort of questions, the first thing we know is need to know is where is the minimum of f of omega? Well, to do that, you just take df by d omega and set it equal to zero, find its minimum. And uh, just going back to what that function was, I'm not sure I can get all this on the same slide here. Well, I got this mass ratio and then that term, so let's just do it. So we get minus two electron to ion mass ratio uh, omega over omega cubed, and then minus two uh, one divided by omega minus k dot v naught e quantity cubed. Okay, now I want to set that equal to zero. But if I look at my sort of diagram up here, I can kind of tell, since this was so much stronger singularity than that one, that roughly speaking, my root's going to be very close to zero, or at least not close to there. So what that means relative to solving this equation, and, and this is also a help with diagramming the function of omega is that I might as well ignore the omega with respect to the uh, k dot v, okay? Because I'm, you, you know, I'm a very small omega and this distance is dominant. Um, that being e the case, then all I have to do is, uh, is take the cube root of this equation. Um, and what I uh, then find is that omega is equal to the cube root of the electron to ion mass ratio. Uh, and then you know, times k dot v naught e. How big is the cube root of the mass ratio? Well, let's do a little bit of algebra over here, or just commentary. Uh, mi over me for protons to electrons, 1,836. Square root of mi over me is equal to um, uh, 42.85. And I always forget precisely, but mi over me to the one-third power uh, turns out to be about 13. So this is one-thirteenth of k dot v. So it's, you know, one-thirteenth over here. Now, why did we want to know that? Well, what we wanted to do was to calculate the minimum value of this f of omega so that we could find out how large we had to make omega pe squared to lose the two roots to get complex conjugates to get an instability. So let's find the value of f at that position. So value of f of omega at its minimum. And at that point, f is equal to m over me over mi divided by omega squared plus 1 over omega minus uh, k dot v naught e quantity squared goes to, well, let's just look at our form here. It's me over mi, and 1 over omega squared is me over mi to the 1 third squared, or that's to the 2 thirds, and then this becomes k dot v naught e quantity squared. Uh, and then we have this other term, which we can approximate by, again, k over v naught e squared. Um, and this then becomes, let's see, there's one total power, me over mi in the numerator, and then same thing to the two-thirds power in the denominator. So overall, we just can get me over mi to the one-third, and then plus one, and all of these are t divided by k dot v naught e squared. Now, we had that 
you know, this is one thirteenth, and so, you know, approximating here, not worrying about 10% corrections, this turns out to be then just 1 over k dot v naught e quantity squared. Now, to have an instability, what we needed to have was we needed to have 1 over omega p squared be lower than that minimum. So for instability, what we need is 1 over omega p e squared less than the minimum of f of omega, which we've de just determined is approximately 1 over k dot v naught e quantity squared. Or this leads, flipping the uh, flipping things upside down, this leads to omega p e squared is greater than k dot v naught e squared. Actually, it's the whole thing squared, so perhaps I better <laughs> do that upright. So basically, this says if you have an electron species flowing in a plasma, okay, so it's, there's non zero flow velocity, the ions are at rest, you can get an instability for some given k value, perhaps determined by the eigenmodes of the system, okay, you know, physical length k is pi over L or something like that, uh, if your density is high enough. And so the, the lowest, the smallest k modes, those which are most extended, require the least density, and the highest k modes require higher densities. So indeed, it's the geometric constraint that tends to set the uh, the minimum k. Okay, H how um, how big? Uh, well, suppose so. This is the plasma. This is a statement of how high the plasma density has to be to get instability. How rapidly do these modes grow? Well, we'd like to estimate. Again, you can always set up a, an equation for the fourth order. Uh, a fourth order equation in polynomial equation in omega and solve it, but uh, we're given to trying to estimate these things. It's a little easier work and, you know, we don't need a particularly exact answer, it turns out. So what we'd like to know is what is the growth rate of these instabilities, or at least approximate growth rate. How would we um, estimate that? Well, what we do is we go near that minimum, so let's just say near minimum, namely a little bit below it. Um, then we would have that, that our dispersion, well, I need to write our dispersion relation here. We have omega p, 1 over omega p e squared is equal to m e over m i divided by omega squared and then plus 1 over omega minus k dot v, not e squared. And this goes to, and I'm going to now put the omega squared up above, so it's just omega squared over omega p e squared is equal to m e over m i plus, and then we're going to have omega squared over omega minus k dot v naught e squared. Now, near that minimum, okay, that's still there, but we have omega uh, m e over m i, um, it turns out that this function to the right here, again, the omega in the denominator is not so important. And we had an omega from the previous business. Uh, and that was that the omega, and, and actually we'll need a minus sign just if you go through the mathematics of being unstable, um, was the electron to ion mass ratio to the one third power, but now squared is to the two thirds then and then a k dot v naught e, uh, all divided by squared, k dot v naught e uh, squared. And these two factors of k dot v naught e cancel. And the electron to ion mass ratio to the full first power 
is much smaller, namely by the factor of one-third compared to that term. <coughs> so we're perfectly happy to neglect it. Now if we take the, uh, we need to take the square root of this equation, and what we then find is that the maximum imaginary part of omega, since we'll get a, a um, what do you call it, uh, complex conjugate roots and so forth, uh, is approximately equal to the cube root of me over mi, the one-third, third times the electron plasma frequency. Now, uh, along the course of the analysis, we made an assumption, a few assumptions. Uh, one of them in particular was we said, well, we're going to neglect collisions. Was that okay? Well, implicitly what we said was that this growth was going to be rapid compared to collisions, collision frequency, right? And if you remember, the collision frequency was sort of given by omega PE divided by uh, 4 pi n lambda Debye cubed, number of particles in a Debye sphere, times log lambda, which was the logarithm of the denominator, basically. And for typical cases, this turns out to be like 10 to the minus 6th omega P. Okay, typical laboratory type plasmas. So indeed, since the mass ratio, you know, to the one-third power, it only says this thing is growing at about a tenth of the plasma frequency. Typical laboratory plasma was omega PE, 10 to the 11th per second, right? 10 to the 10th, 10 to the 11th, even 10 to the 12th, depending on density. Typical laboratory plasma. So this is growing at, you know, only one order of magnitude slower than that. So this is sort of sub-nanosecond growth type stuff. It's very fast, okay? So if you have a two-stream instability, it really, you know, grows rapidly. It grows on the electron plasma frequency time scale plasma period, 10 plasma periods, but who's going to argue about that, so to speak? Okay, so the general idea is that if you have gross velocity space distortions, big flows, okay, then you're going to get relatively rapid at plasma frequency type rates, uh, instabilities which will be trying to relax those um, uh, flows of one species relative to another. So let's just mention that, come back to our diagram here a little bit. Uh, what, do, what do we mean by, what do I mean by that? Well, effectively what happens is these instabilities pull down uh, the electron distribution function into the ion one. One other thing just as a sort of commentary, we uh, neglected, okay, thermal effects, right? We said, you know, we got a cold plasma, but most plasmas have a little bit of temperature, okay? What happens if we put that on? Well, what happens is, is it kind of broadens the resonances uh, to a width of about the thermal velocities, okay? But the, since the ion thermal velocity is very small, so with the ion thermal velocity gets broadened, you know, the electrons get broadened by an electron thermal velocity, uh, but the ions by an ion thermal velocity. But that requires kinetic theory, and we'll, we'll worry about that in a little bit. But notice that the place where I got the instability was away from those two resonances, so uh, my calculation is presumably okay. It's effective, a cold plasma approximation was a reasonable approximation. So this basic procedure of writing the dispersion relation as a function, as one function of density and another function of frequency, and then plotting a relatively complicated function of omega and finding, well, at certain conditions I have all the roots, all the real roots I need, so there's no unstable roots, but if I go below certain boundaries, uh, then go beyond certain boundaries, then I lose a couple of roots into the complex plane. Uh, this is a relatively general procedure that works for so-called two-stream instabilities. Uh, sometimes people have an electron stream here and another electron stream here, streaming against each other with an ion background. 
or it works for so-called beam plasma instabilities. You've got most of a plasma at rest. You've got a little beam of particles. Uh, it works for uh, all kinds of those sorts of streaming instabilities where thermal corrections are not too uh, significant. Okay, to conclude then what I want to talk about instabilities, uh, I want to mention some of the other ones that, um, that Chen talks about. So let's uh, just talk about some other types of instabilities for a moment here. Um, looks like we're up to number eight here if I keep track of order. Um, and because he talks about a number of them in his chapter six, um, we won't go through all of them. But a particular one uh, is a, what he calls the gravitational instability. And that is, in fact, the same instability as what we called the Rayleigh-Taylor type instability. Or it was the heavy fluid on the li over the light fluid, you know, uh, better put the plasma in a minimum in the magnetic field, uh, all that sort of thing. So it's sometimes called Rayleigh-Taylor instability when one thinks of fluid mechanics analogies or fluid uh, instability analogies. Or in plasma physics literature, it's more often called the so-called interchange instability. Or sometimes it's called the flute instability because it's relatively constant along the magnetic field. And then there are certain versions of it in high beta plasmas called ballooning instabilities, whereby if you have average good curvature but local regions of bad curvature, the mode can balloon or get bigger in the bad curvature regions and emphasize those, and that's then called a ballooning instability. This mode, if it happens, okay, is a very macroscopic mode. You know, heavy fluid over light fluid type of thing. You can see it physically almost, uh, or at least kind of understand what's going on. Um, and so it has very serious effects on, on the macroscopic plasma, okay? Uh, namely, you lose the plasma from the confinement region that you thought you were holding it in is what it amounts to. Uh, and so uh, these are rather dramatic instabilities. Um, they're basically lost from the confinement region. On what time scale? Well, it would be on some sense of the instability time scale. And that would be in 1 over the growth rate time scale. But if you look back, that was sort of the ratio of the or plasma radius to radius of curvature divided by the sound speed. So it's basically at a sound speed or a hydrodynamic speed. And these are sometimes also called ideal magnetohydrodynamic instabilities. So this is a, a, a big loss of the plasma, and you usually do your best to avoid these types of instabilities. Another type of instability that comes up in inhomogeneous plasmas is the so-called drift instabilities. Here, what happens is that the real part of the frequency of the mode is given by the Doppler shift of the diamagnetic flow. So what you find is that omega is equal to k dot v diamagnetic, where v diamagnetic is, of course, um, 1 over n q b cross gradient of pressure divided by b squared, just the so-called diamagnetic flow velocity. And people often define this quantity, k dot v dia, as something which is called omega star. Um, star, I'm not quite sure why, asterisk, that is. Um, just a common notation. Also, these types of instabilities generally require uh, so-called adiabatic electrons responses but fluid ions 
Um, another, one, another feature of them is that you have the frequency is approximately equal to this diamagnetic drift frequency and plus omega i. And usually you have very small growth rates, omega i, much less than omega star. Growth or damping rates, it turns out. Um, and how do you get instabilities? Well, you get omega i greater than zero, basically due to non-adiabatic processes. If you had purely, elect purely adiabatic electrons, you get basically no transfer of energy from the waves to the particles or vice versa, and so you don't get anything. And non-adiabatic processes might be collisions, or they might be collision-less damping, which we will call Landau damping in a little while. Uh, also, you get so-called finite Larmor radius effects, FLR, some people call them, uh, which causes the E cross B drifts of the electrons and ions to be different, as we've mentioned before, uh, et cetera. Now, in contrast to the macroscopic Rayleigh-Taylor gravitational instabilities, these drift instabilities are microscopic. They're small scale. And they're sort of ubiquitous or universal, as some people call them, universal instabilities sometimes, because anytime I have a confined or inhomogeneous plasma, which is pretty common, I'm going to get a pressure gradient. And therefore, I will get a diamagnetic flow. And therefore, I will have these types of waves in a plasma. You know, diamagnetic drift which is a flow that I'll just, it's a flow of the plasma, and I'll get such waves. Um, so they're universal from that standpoint. However, they tend to be localized within a few gyro radii of particular surfaces in a plasma or particular field lines. Their effects are localized within 5 or 10 gyro radii, and so they're sort of small scale. They're not as small as the gyro radius, but they're only 5 to 10 times that. And so what we tend to feel is that these are microscopic modes which lead to microturbulence in a plasma, but not to catastrophic uh, types of um, effects. They're not as big and lumpy and macroscopic as the gravitational instabilities, and secondly, their growth rates are not as large. Okay. So they're kind of more benign, local little things. You don't like them, but, you know, who, but they're not devastating. Let's put it that way. Um, the final type of additional ones are so-called loss cone or temperature anisotropy. Um, or bump on tail instabilities. And a recent example which is becoming popular is uh, something called free electron lasers. In fact, are an example of, of so-called kinetic instabilities. Uh, free electron lasers. We'll come back to this. But basically, all of these types of instabilities are so-called inverted population type instabilities. Inverted, or it's in quotes here. The idea is that you localize something in velocity space, maybe a little bump on a tail of a particles or of a distribution function, or loss cones, you remember we had half of velocity space was open and half was closed, you know, and, or full and uh, so forth. And in free electron lasers, you create a situation as if it's an inverted population type of situation. And so what happens is these create uh, laser type actions, by which you mean you take energy out of those inverted populations and put them into the waves. Uh, that basically remove um, the anisotropies in velocity space. 
Now, in, um, so this is, well, in order to describe these particular types of instabilities, we need kinetic theory to be able to do that. And that provides a sort of introduction to our next uh, topic, uh, which is kinetic theory. Um, the idea here is now that we've gone through, well, some of the instabilities in a sort of general way. Uh, instabilities in the plasma is a very fertile field, by which I mean there's huge numbers of papers and literature written on this subject. And uh, it fills volumes and so forth. And we have, of course, 724, which goes into waves and instabilities in plasmas. And many, many topics come into various instabilities in plasmas. And all we're trying to do here is give a, a brief overview of what goes on. So that basically concludes what I want to say about types of instabilities. And after break here in a minute, uh, what we will then discuss is we'll go on into discussing kinetic theory. Uh, and we'll come back to some particular discussions of some of these particular kinetic instabilities uh, at that time. But uh, for the moment, we'll close off the discussion of, of instabilities.